All right, so welcome to Lunch and Learn Geocaching. My name is Joe Klein. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the GIS or Geographic Information Systems um, and Data Visualization Librarian at UNC Greensboro. So today I'm going to be um, showing y'all what geocaching is, how it works, and how you can join in on the fun and why I think you should too. So why I do geocaching. So geocaching is um, a real world outdoor treasure hunting game using GPS enabled devices. And I'll get back to what GPS enabled devices means. Um, so this is straight from the geocaching 101 page on geocaching.com. They're the biggest geocaching website, um, I believe at least in the United States, if not the world. So here are some examples of what geocaches look like. So traditional geocaches as we call them are typically a container of some kind um, which are placed somewhere. They could be in the woods, they could be placed, um, for example, like this one in Amsterdam, they could be placed you know, on a brick wall or in an old electric housing, um, or they could be placed um, in, for example, the end cap of a, uh, a chain link fence if you're in a more urban area or places that have fences. So I think this one is along a highway, which is pretty cool. So geocaches can be found pretty much anywhere. Um, and it's also international. So if you're in a new country, a new city, a new place, um, there may be a geocache around you. So the person placing the cache or the geocache will record the coordinates that they place this cache at. So where it is located geographically. They will then log those coordinates online at geocaching.com or on another geocaching forum. So there are a couple of other forums and groups out there that don't wanna use geocaching.com for people to use as well. Um, and as you can see, the containers vary. So they vary anywhere from, you know, your plastic Tupperware containers to ammo canisters was a really popular one for a while um, to just any random box or tin that you can find. Um, so a lot of times I use old like coffee tins, which is really fun because um, it's free-ish. I already bought the coffee. So other types of caches do exist other than your traditional geocache, which is just a container in the woods or somewhere. So you've got mystery caches, which sometimes have a puzzle that you have to solve in order to find the container, or earth caches, which can um, or usually involve geological formations. So those are pretty cool. So if you've got a water uh, waterfall um, or a cool geological formation, like you live near the Grand Canyon, say, um, there may be an earth cache that will direct you to a point where you can see this cool geographic feature, um, but there might not necessarily be a container there. Um, one cool cache that I found in Colorado was what we call a virtual cache. So um, if you went to that location at a specific time around sunset in the summer during a certain season, um, there's not a container there for you to find, but you get a great view of golden eagles that would travel up from the valley at that specific time of day. So it was a really cool, you know, go here to see a cool site. Um, and that is on the geocaching site as well. Geocaches come in all shapes and sizes. So in addition to your more traditional um, containers like the Tupperware um, ammo canisters and other types of boxes and random things, there are things like this really cool one, which I absolutely love, which is a snail shell that somebody put a straw and a small um, piece of paper inside on a magnet. So they just magnet or stick this snail shell to a nail in a tree and it, it that's a geocache, but it's so small. Like I would never be able to find this one. That's one of my favorites. And I mentioned the piece of paper that they put inside this snail shell. So geocaches will contain a logbook or log sheet for you to write your date, the date that you found the geocache, the username. So whatever username you have on geocaching.com or the other forum, just to say, hey, this is me, I found this cache. Um, and then a quick blurb or a message for some of the bigger geocaches. So if it is in an ammo canister or like this one, which is in a small clear Tupperware, you can see there's some other things written on these. Um, cards and logs. So in addition to the logbook or log sheet, which is kind of the bare minimum for any geocache, sometimes there's fun stuff. So this one has a thing we like to call a travel bug, um, which is a object or item that you can track as it goes from cache to cache. And this one's pretty cool because it has a camera on it. So I'm guessing this travel bug um, has, usually they have instructions for what they want you to do with it. Um, so some of them want to visit each individual geocache, as many geocaches as possible. Some of them want to go to a specific state or country. 
Um, and some of them just want to travel and you know see the world. So this one, it looks like has a camera. So I'm willing to bet the creator of this travel bug wanted you to take a picture of something when you find it and then bring the camera and travel bug to a different geocache. Um, so it's a really interesting way to kind of build community and do like a quick challenge or puzzle. Some other fun stuff could include knickknacks. So things like, you know, tiny Rubik's cubes, pens, stickers. I've seen like fridge magnets in there sometimes too, which is pretty cool. You've got your travel bugs in the upper right, which I kind of described already a little bit with the camera. Um, here's an example of one of the more old school travel bugs, like a literal punch buggy travel bug. Um, so they have um, a barcode or a code that you can put into the geocaching.com website and you can track where this one um, tag or object has been, you know, how many geocaches has it been to, which states has it traveled to. Um, and some of them will have fun challenges or something. So I have a couple of travel bugs out there that are attached to four rubber ducks and their goal is to race. So each duck wants to make it the furthest distance from its home point. So, and those are still kind of floating around somewhere and some ducks are winning, some ducks haven't moved in like two years. And um, it's a, a, a fun way to keep track of where things have been. You've also got geocoins, which are small, usually they're, you know, maybe an inch in diameter, like a small quarter. Um, and they have cool things printed on them. So this one uh, was created for the Appalachian Trail on the East Coast. So from Georgia, Georgia to Maine, um, and they hit it uh, or they put a lot of these different coins. So I think they usually print like 20 or 50 at a time. And they put them in different geocaches along the Appalachian Trail for people to find. Um, so if you take a coin, usually the expectation is if you take stuff, you leave stuff. So if I take a coin, I might leave a small Rubik's cube or a pen or something, you know, knickknacky that's pretty cool. Um, but the geocoins you typically keep, unlike the travel bugs, which you're expected to put in a different cache. Um, geocoins are also created for like different events. So there's a lot of um, groups or events that will print geocoins for this specific um, thing to say, hey, I went to this, I found a geocache, you know, for the 2017 UNCG geocache jamboree um, or something like that. So it's a, a kind of a fun keepsake for geocaching. And then there are other trackables too. So this one is really cool. Um, it's sort of like a travel bug or a geocoin. Um, they call this a trilobite, and I'm not 100% sure what the whole trilobite refers to in geocaching context, but um, it shows the location of the Burgess Shale in British Columbia, um, as well as the coordinates for it. And it's got a little bit more information, it looks like about what the shale was like in the Cambrian age. So it's a little geological, um, I guess, sneak peek or Easter egg that you could find. Um, and it looks like a pretty cool coin. So I'll probably be looking up this number at some point to see what this coin is and what it means and why it's floating around in all of these geocaches. Um, so one of the main rules that I kind of mentioned already is take some stuff and leave some stuff. So when you see a cache on the geocaching.com website, um, usually you'll bring like a pen if you've got small objects like marbles. Um, a lot of kids will geocache with their parents. So sometimes I leave like, you know, small things from like Michael's or a craft store for them to do, um, which is pretty fun. So how does it work? Like I mentioned before, um, a person will place a geocache or a container or you know any type of geocache, and they will log its location on a site like geocaching.com. And this is a screenshot of the geocaching.com map um, where you can look for geocaches in your area or anywhere throughout the world, actually. Um, to find a cache, you create a free basic membership account. It's just a free account that you can create. And you can search for any location in the world and get a description of the geocaches, the coordinates to find them, and a hint for most geocaches. So sometimes they'll have hints if they're a little bit more difficult to find. So right now I have it zoomed in on Greensboro, kind of around UNCG, um, a little bit over, and Greensboro College. And a lot of universities will have a geocache or two on campus because a lot of college students grow up geocaching and they will create a cache. Or people like me who work on campus will um, create one for our students. Um, so here's an example of some caches. You've got your traditional caches in green. You've got your mystery caches. So this is one of the geocaches that was placed by one of my colleagues at the libraries. Um, so you have to go through a puzzle and um, solve a riddle in order to find this and log it. 
And then you've got things like this ghost cache over here, which is a virtual cache. Um, so that is similar to the Golden Eagles cache that I had in Colorado, where if you just stand in a specific place, you'll see a cool view, but there's nothing actually there. Um, some of them have things like QR codes that you can scan now at the actual coordinates, and it'll um, open up like a virtual reality overlay on your camera, which is pretty cool. So you can use it for like tours or things like that too. All righty. So you, in order to find caches, would create that free account, search for something, get the coordinates. Then you can put the coordinates into your phone or your GPS device. Um, or you can also use the geocaching.com app. So they do have an app that you can download to a smartphone, um, which will help you navigate to that specific coordinate of the geocache, um, which is pretty handy if you've got a smartphone, if you're traveling to a new city or a new town, or if you're you know, just driving across country um, or down the highway. So if I go from Greensboro to Winston-Salem, there's a number across uh, along the highway that you can get. Um, or if you're just going for a walk around your neighborhood, it's kind of handy to have the app on you. So you can just search for things on the go. So geocaching uses GPS in order to do all of this fun stuff. So in order to find and log the coordinates, it uses GPS, um, which refers to the global positioning system. So this is a little bit more common than it was when geocaching first started. So, you know, how many of y'all use Google Maps or Apple Maps or some, side, some sort of GPS navigation um, to just get around, you know, your city, your town, um, or to go to new places? Um, whereas in the past we used maps um, maybe we had a, a GPS receiver or something like that to figure out where we were currently. But for the most part, you know, we navigated using maps or MapQuest, um, if you're like me. So the global positioning system is a series or what they call a constellation of satellites which orbit the Earth. Um, the GPS that I'm referring to here um, refers to the United States system. So the United States government actually owns and, and commands and runs this entire system. But there are other um, countries that have their own global positioning systems. And there's kind of an international GPS community too, which is what lets geocaching be an international activity and not just a United States activity. Um, so they, these satellites orbit and they constantly send and receive location information and other information like internet connectivity, you know, TV, if you've got satellite or dish. Um, you may have heard of, I think Starlink is the kind of train of satellites that you can see in the night sky. And it's a train of like 20 to 60 um, tiny white dots that just go across in a line. Um, and those are a type of satellite as well. So for geocaching, you take the coordinates of a geocache, you put it up on those forums, you find the geocache coordinate as a user and you put it into your phone or your um, GPS device. So I have this kind of like eTrex, I don't know if you'll be able to see it with my background. Um, you put it into your device or your phone and it will navigate to it. In order to navigate to it, it needs to know where you are. So this is where that GPS system comes into play and really makes this a thing that can happen. So it starts with tracking stations on Earth, which use radio to determine the orbits of GPS satellites. So it figures out where these, G, uh, these satellites are in orbit. It sends that information to command centers. So step number two here. And these command centers, like the ones, they're mostly on Air Force bases. Um, transmit orbital data, so where those satellites are, um, time corrections, so to make sure the satellites are synced up um, in time, and then the locations of other satellites. So it sends all of that to these um, GPS, the GPS constellation, or all of these different satellites. And then these satellites, at the same time, because they have that time correction, will transmit that synchronized time and orbital data back to Earth. So they do this all the time, constantly, um, and then our phones, our GPS receivers, our GPS handheld units pick up this information, this orbital data, and it calculates where these satellites are and where your current location is um, based on how long it takes it to reach a signal. So if it gets a, sat a signal from satellite one, and it's like, okay, satellite one is located here, it's telling me it's located here, and it took me eight seconds to get that signal. Satellite two is located, let's say 100 meters more east or like, you know, somewhere else in the sky. 
And it took me nine seconds to get that. So it can take these differences in time and location. It can calculate exactly where you are specifically with that receiver. Um, phones can use things like your mobile network or Wi-Fi to um, get a better idea of where you are too. So they can use that to enhance the accuracy of where you're located. So um, I mention all this because it's really fun. Ooh, and I think we might have a question. Yes. Sorry, how much yeah. does the e track cost? Yeah, so the e tracks so I've got an e tracks 10, which I got forever ago. And I think at the time when I bought it, like 10 years ago, it was like $70. So it might be cheaper now. Um, it depends. There's a lot of different ranges of um, the Garmin GPSs and other, I think Trimble is another brand. So they can range anywhere from like 50 to several thousand dollars. Um, but there's usually a one or two, like 50, 20 to $50 um, versions out there. And there's a lot of kind of off-brand versions that you can get too, which are not as accurate, but they fulfill the purpose if you're geocaching with it or just learning GPS. Um, okay, and yes, and then one more reminder too, if you have questions at any time, uh, Megan will interrupt me so we can answer those. So please put those in the chat if you have them or raise your hand. So the reason I mentioned GPS and the global positioning system um, is to kind of get into the origin of geocaching, which I think is fascinating. So in May 2000, um, we had a thing called selective availability. So this is the US government intentionally um, obfuscating or lowering the accuracy of GPS coordinates um, for things like, you know, national security or, you know, no one really used GPS at the time. We didn't use it to navigate. So it wasn't really a thing that civilians needed to use. Um, in May 2000, they decided to end this um, for whichever reasons, which I will not go into here, but that's another fantastic, you know, Wikipedia dive if you do have time and interest in it. So in May 2000, the error or, you know, whether my GP, if my GPS is telling me that I'm located at this specific coordinate, or if my phone is telling me I'm located at this specific coordinate, it might be, you know, 10 feet, 10 meters, which is roughly 30 feet, um, or even further off. So it's the difference between me being able to tell that I'm inside a football stadium or outside a football stadium, basically. Um, so before 2000, before selective availability was turned off, you might, the location that your GPS tells you might be anywhere from like, I think the lowest was like 10 meters to the highest being like 80 meters. And again, there's like roughly three feet in a meter. So 80 meters is um, 240 feet. And that's a big um, for, you know, trying to find a small container in the woods or a specific object with a coordinate. That's really difficult to pinpoint that. Afterwards, we went from, you know, that 80 meters kind of 40 meter average error to like 2.8 to five meter average. So right now I believe it's anywhere from five to 10 meters, depending on if you're outside or inside or have a good clear view of the sky. Um, so now it became a lot more simple or easy to find a specific object in the woods, say like a geocache. So this is where Dave Ulmer comes in. Dave Ulmer was a GPS enthusiast, enthusiast, a civilian GPS enthusiast. So he wasn't able to get super accurate GPS coordinates. Um, until after 2000. So in May of 2000, when selective availability ended, he wanted to test out this new accuracy. So he hit a container um, in Oregon, I think somewhere in Oregon, he put some goodies in it. So he put some knickknacks, some books, some um, videos, which I'm guessing would be like some sort of cassette at the time or a CD for music and some puzzles and a guest book for people to sign it. And he posted the coordinates on one of his GPS forums because geocaching.com didn't exist at the time and directed people to find it. If they took an item, they should leave an item and sign the guest book. And those were the only rules. And from there, it really took off. So now we've got hundreds of thousands, if not millions of geocaches around the world, um, all because of this one selective availability you know, feature, which was turned off in 2000. Um, here's another kind of view of what this error looks like. So you've got um, zero meters. If you're trying to find this dot right in the middle of this chart, before selective availability was turned off, it, your GPS might put you anywhere from, you know, here's around, let's say that's 75 meters or 80 meters too far to the north um, or any other thing versus afterwards where it's a lot easier to pinpoint a specific area. And to put these kind of in context with geographic location, so um, some of y'all might not be familiar with the UNCG campus, but 
from the um, EUC Elliott University um, Center or Commons, um, which is kind of the main building on campus for people to just, you know, get food. Um, they've got a lot of other offices and things in there, kind of our, our Commons Center. If you were trying to find the doorway to the EUC before selective availability ended, your GPS or your phone might dump you in the library, which is a decent walk away. Um, so I scaled this down to this chart using um, this walkway here to the Walker parking deck, which is roughly 90 meters. Um, so this is to scale with this 100 meter um, image in the background. So before selective availability, it might put you anywhere on the Kaplan Commons in any of these buildings instead of your uh, EUC doors that you're trying to get to versus afterwards, which is where it kind of lumps you, you'll end up by the EUC doors. So it's a lot easier to find geocaches now. Um, and I really like this. This is really cool to me because this is also what lets us use GPS for navigation when we're driving um, or just walking down cities. So before when selective availability was a thing, we would never have been able to use that for navigation. Um, like I said before, it's the difference between being inside the football stadium or outside the football stadium, you wouldn't be able to tell where specifically you are in the football stadium until now. So this is one of the really cool things that enables us to create this really fun geocaching game, but also just navigate and use GPS in our everyday lives. So what you need to go geocaching, um, and I already kind of mentioned the um, Garmin eTrax um, GPS unit. I have to hold it in front of my face so you can see it with my background. Um, so you need yourself. That's the bare minimum. Honestly, you could get away with just having yourself and a friend with a, a, a geocaching.com membership. Um, you need a computer or internet connection um, or the geocaching app on the smartphone. And then a free geocaching.com basic membership. So what I do sometimes um, before I had my account would just partner up with a friend who has one. Um, so if you don't really want to create an account yet, um, you're more than welcome to email me. I have my, my contact at the end and I would love to go on geocaching trips. So I'm hoping to do more um, on campus too. But that's really all you need. You don't technically need a phone with an app. You don't technically need a GPS receiver or handheld. Um, some people will print out a Google Maps image of where the geocache is and they'll use that to find it using landmarks um, or uh, sometimes even compass and maps if you wanna get super into it. Um, so you don't technically need a GPS handheld, um, but it does help. So uh, other optional but helpful things include footwear or mobility devices for off-roading. So um, some caches are grab and go. So they're in the description, it'll say this is a grab and go cache. You can park, leave your car and just it's right there. You don't have to go hiking super deep into the woods or anywhere. And some of them are in cities. So it's, you know, underneath a bar or a table at a bar or at a restaurant. Um, and the restaurant's aware of it, so they know it's there. So for other ones though, some caches might be in the woods. They might be um, around thorns or brambles, mud, maybe poison ivy. So depending on what the description of a cache says, you wanna make sure you're addressing appropriately based on that um, description and what you should expect. Um, and kind of likewise, some caches are easier to find in the winter where there's not as much plant growth kind of surrounding it. So the description will usually say that too. Um, a pencil or pen is pretty helpful. So some caches will be big enough to have a pen so that you can sign the log or the guest book. But some of them are really, really tiny like that snail shell. So you would need to bring your own pen or pencil in order to write on the log there. And then if you're gonna be doing nighttime caching, which is a thing that happens, um, you should bring a flashlight. Um, some geocaches are pretty cool and they'll direct you to bring like a laser pointer or they will have a laser pointer like tied to a tree somewhere. Um, there's really one really cool one where there's a mirror in a tree. So the, geo, the coordinates of this, this geocache will point you to a tree and you'll look up and you'll see the mirror. And at night you have to take a laser pointer and point it from that coordinate into the mirror and it will um, point the laser at the geocache's location. And it's super complicated, like, you know, fun stuff like that. Um, where, who would ever think? Um, and another reason why some folks might go nighttime caching um, and something you'll see on websites as well on the geocaching website is muggles is what they refer to it. So people who aren't aware of what geocaching is, um, now y'all all know about the game of geocaching, so you would no longer be muggles. Um, and this is a term that they pulled from Harry Potter, the Harry Potter series. So you can tell that this game was created in the 2000s 
um, right around when Harry Potter first came out. So muggle just refers to anybody who doesn't know what geocaching is. Um, I like it when people see me geocaching and ask what I'm doing because it's a learning opportunity. I can tell them like, yeah, I'm doing this really cool, fun game. Um, but you know, some folks might want to be more secretive about it. And sometimes it's an issue where you don't want um, a random person who doesn't know what the game is to find a geocache container um, because they might be confused about it or they might not know what it is. Um, and they might, uh, so sometimes you'll find a container in the woods, you know, and you think it's trash, like somebody has littered and dumped this cool bit container um, because it doesn't have any notice that it's a geocache on it. So they try to keep it a little bit more private. And as Megan said in the chat, right, how often are the police asking, like, what are you up to? Um, a lot of cache people or people who place geocaches, I call them cache people, <laughs> um, will notify, you know, the owners of buildings, the park authorities, whoever, like the state park people, um, or the police, if there's, for example, the ones on UNCG campus, they'll tell UNCG campus police that there is a geocache here. If you see somebody looking suspicious, looking for an object or, you know, in the bushes, they're geocaching. Don't, don't panic. Um, so that, you know, is one thing that people that place these keep in mind. So some reasons why I geocache. Um, I like it because it can help build navigation skills using GPS and maps. So sometimes if I'm feeling like going for a hike, I'll bring along a, a compass and a map. I'll use my GPS to get to the cache, and then I will use my compass and map to get out um, if I'm not on a trail. And I never really venture too far off the trail, honestly. So, you know, limited helpfulness. Um, but you can turn it into any type of activity that you want. So if you are in a field or a job or um, want to be in a field or job where you will need to use GPS or map navigation, it's really good practice for that. Um, it's good for health and wellness. So don't be fooled by all the icons I have here of like, you know, backpacks and hiking and binoculars and biking. Um, there are some very low impact geocaches out there where you can pull up, maybe go for a quick walk around a parking lot, if that. Um, so there's a geocache for everybody just about. Um, and then there are some geocaches that are, you know, 10 miles into the woods on top of a mountain. <laughs> um, so it really just depends on what you want to get out of it. Um, I also like it because it's good practice for logging data in the field. So a lot of people, especially um, like biologists, ecologists, environmental um, surveyors, for example, or geologists, will have to collect data about their study subject. So about bees, about birds, um, about plants in the field during rainy conditions, you know, really, really hot, sunny, humid conditions maybe. Um, so going geocaching is a really good way to practice that, to practice hiking out somewhere in these conditions that you normally wouldn't get out into. Um, and then practicing writing down the date, the time, maybe sometimes I'll collect like wind speed if I'm being super into it. Um, and sometimes since I'm a birder, I like to sit down when I find a cache and record for like 10 minutes, you know, how many birds do I hear and can I identify them? And I'll put that with my log when I log the geocache on the website, um, which is kind of fun sometimes. Um, another reason I like to do it is to build community. So it's a huge forum, it's international. Um, if you're not, if you just moved to a new place or if you haven't really explored the place where you live or where you're visiting, you can use geocaches to get to know the actual physical location of these places. So where somebody else has seen this cool object or place. Um, but then you can also build community during like the events where they have like geocaching jamborees or other events um, or just through the forums. So it's really fun when you start to see the same people pop up in your area and you're like, okay, I know you. Um, and I've actually found one of my colleagues is a geocacher too. So I found him through uh, one of the geocaches on campus too. And then finally, just for fun, it's really fun to just go and try to find something using GPS and have that challenge. So I have a link of sources here and I have a, a link to these slides in the next slide too, but I do wanna point out this history of geocaching, which is where I pulled that information about selective availability and GPSs. Um, so it's a fascinating, interesting read and it really just goes into you know, how GPS, how that selective availability, turning that off, really led to how we use GPS today and just about everything. Um, so I definitely recommend that if you have like a, you know, 15 minutes to, to go through a, a little quick article. So if there are any other questions, um, I know I answered about the, the eTrex cost and I'm happy to talk more about those. Um, You're also welcome to schedule a meeting with me um, using this Go link um, or to download these slides. And then I'll have the recording of this up at some point at this URL as well.
And as Terry said in the chat, it's very frustrating when you can't find it, if you're unsure if it's no longer there. So sometimes, you know, if the geocache gets um, uh, found by a muggle or somebody who's not familiar with it and they, they chuck it, or if, you know, for example, the forest floods and your geocache gets swept away or various other reasons, maybe a bird picked up the snail shell off of your magnetic nail. Um, it's hard to tell whether you just can't find it or if it's actually gone. So as Megan says, you can add the note to the site when you don't find a cache, you can still log it and say you didn't find it. Um, and then usually what will happen is the owner of the geocache will go and check on it. So there's always a steward of geocaches who are responsible for upkeep and maintenance, you know, changing out the logs if it gets wet, like if it rains and it's not a watertight container, they'll replace the logs so that it's not soggy. Um, they'll put cool items and stuff in there. Um, but yes, agreed. I don't find like maybe 75% of the caches I try to find just because I'm not very good at finding things yet. Um, and I don't know if it's not there or if I'm just really unobservant. 